Good afternoon, everybody. I see by the TV screen that the press corps has moved into another location. How y'all doing? Good. They're waving. You can't see that. Um, I want to say happy birthday to Lena. Uh, Lena is one of our sign language interpreters. So I don't know, Lena, if you can, uh, I won't be able to see you, but you can appear in the uh, side of the screen or something and wave to everybody. But happy birthday. Uh, we really appreciate what, what you all do uh, every, every single day. So thank you. I'm wearing today a uh, Shawnee State tie, bears, and um, wearing it in <clears throat> honor today of uh, our youngest daughter, Anna's uh, good friend, Becky. And so, Becky, we'll give you a, a shout out. I know you went to Shawnee State and graduated from there, and uh, hope you're doing well. You know, <clears throat> we're very, very proud in Ohio uh, of the innovation uh, and the smart problem solving attitude that we have in this state. It's a great, great tradition. Uh, and we see it daily. Uh, we've talked to you, for example, about the amazing process that Battelle created to sanitize the N95 mask to help with the severe PPE uh, shortage that we have. Uh, what many people don't know is that this started with a simple conversation, and the story, I think, is kind of typical Ohio. Uh, <clears throat> smart doctor at Ohio Health raised concerns about PPE shortages in March, and he was talking to talking to, the doctor was talking to a smart scientist at Battelle. Uh, that one conversation led to immediate action from both organizations and a new solution that's not only helping Ohioans, but also uh, is now being felt uh, throughout the country in many, many locations. And so we have a, a video uh, that talks a little bit about this story. Hi, my name is Kevin Hamama. I'm a principal research scientist at Battelle Memorial Institute. I'm Dr. Lori Hamama. I'm a family physician with Ohio Health. And in a former life, <laughs> I was a microbiologist at Battelle. Met almost 18 years ago. 18 years ago. Because we were looking for reasons to interact with each other. Saying, <laughs> how do you pronounce that last name? <laughs> And then here we are, you know, four years later, I, it became my last name. It was through a, an after-dinner conversation where I was sharing with Kevin some of the things that I was struggling with uh, and thinking about and the world is thinking about in this COVID crisis and that really being uh, PPE, specifically N95s and having the right amount of respirators. And I had heard in a meeting at Ohio Health how many days we had of respirators and um, got really nervous. And I just made the casual comment, well, why don't you just clean them up and reuse them? I'm like, you can't do that. I'm like, well, yeah, you can. <laughs> you know, we have some entire team uh, of, of researchers at Patel who, who basically do this uh, for a living, is, is decontaminate various surfaces, materials, equipment to free them of dangerous pathogens. So I didn't believe him. <laughs> it was like, how do we not know this, right? And so he reached out to his colleague, Will Richter, who did the study. I reached out to Doug Knutson, who I report to, our VP of Quality and Patient Safety. And I said, Doug, can I look into this? Because I think this could be a game changer. And he said, absolutely, go. And we had a team pulled together that quickly uh, in just in just really two days. It was pretty incredible. Battelle's reaction was really, um, brought a lot of hope, I think, to um, the frontline caregivers. Yeah, the amount of resources that, you know, Battelle just, just dropped from doing other things to devoting to this, uh, to this partnership with Ohio Health, um, it was pretty incredible. Um, you know, when, when the right decisions are made for the right reasons, it's pretty incredible what you can do. Uh, it's been so cool to watch the team at Ohio Health. Um, you know, I'm, I'm running point for the program, and I have on my team with operations Nikki Ross and Josh Bowles, and oh my goodness, are they incredible. <laughs> the impact that it's having on the healthcare community uh, across the nation is, it's just, it's humbling. Um, Greg Kimmel at Battelle sent me pictures of the semi-trucks leaving for New York with the contamination units, and I think that was the first time it allowed me to pause and see 
how big the impact is. And I, and I just saw a, uh, an internal Battelle posting of the first deployed system in New York receiving their first batch of contaminated PPE. So I just feel so lucky to be part of this and to to have married the right guy at the right time to make to make this happen. That's a great story. You know, the, the, the speed of this project uh, is really amazing. Uh, initial idea, simple conversation occurred on March 13th. Two days later, uh, the teams Ohio Health and Battelle met to start on the solution. Two weeks later, they had that solution. Uh, absolutely amazing. So we thank all of them uh, for getting this done. Uh, let me... Uh, talk a little bit more about this, um, something else that we're starting to do. Um, the need for PPE uh, not only impacts our frontline healthcare workers, uh, but it also certainly our first responders are also facing the same challenges and they need to be protected as well. Uh, so today I'm happy to announce an expansion of Ohio's partnership with Battelle to extend uh, their sanitation services to law enforcement agencies and EMS providers across the state of Ohio. Our Ohio Department of Public Safety and Battelle have now partnered to sanitize N97 masks for all of Ohio's first responders. Uh, Battelle is providing this service for free. Our Ohio State Highway Patrol has developed a statewide collection and distribution system to make this process as simple as possible for local first responders. Uh, this is how it's going to work uh, beginning this Friday uh, at 8 a.m. Local law enforcement agencies and EMS agencies can bring their packaged N95 masks to any Ohio State Highway Patrol post in the state. The patrol will then bring those masks to Battelle in Columbus. Uh, Battelle will sanitize them. The patrol will bring the mask back to each post, and agencies can then come back and pick them up. Uh, this will contribute greatly to our efforts to protect Ohio's protectors. Uh, patrol will be sending out guidelines to local law enforcement later today on how the mask must be packaged. Uh, this process was developed by our Public Safety Strike Force, and it's really a, a great example of our first responder members identifying a problem, working with their state partners on a solution. Uh, we're incredibly grateful for Bedell uh, and salute them for the work that they've done. I want to thank the Ohio Department of Public Safety, the Ohio State Highway Patrol for coordinating this process. Uh, I asked them today, I said, okay, how long is this going to take? Uh, and they assured me that this is going to be two to three days turnaround. Uh, so we're very excited about that. And again, it's an effort to expand the use of our uh, N95 masks uh, that are in continue, uh, unfortunately, to be in short supply. So it's a mul real multiplier uh, effect. Uh, I want to share another uh, good story uh, in regard to some of the things that we're doing uh, this in Ohio that Ohioans are doing. Uh, and this one has to do uh, specifically uh, with the testing. Um, and our challenges there. <clears throat> Health systems worldwide have struggled because of the critical sh shortage of test kit components. Uh, this includes the swabs uh, that are used to collect samples and the sterile solution needed to transport the swabs. Uh, as we've talked about before, sometimes we may have the capacity at, at, at Ohio State or the capacity at Cleveland Clinic or one of the other hospitals, but um, the people who are trying to take the sample can't do it. They don't have the swab. They don't have, they're missing something else. Uh, so recognizing this shortage, a rapidly assembled team of Ohio State University researchers worked literally overnight and within 24 hours created an in-house recipe to make the critical liquid transport medium. Um, again, challenge has been you got to get the swabs, but you also have to have the tube and then you have to have the liquid uh, in, in the tube. Uh, in addition, the Ohio State Wexner Medical Center and Ohio State's College of Medicine, Engineering, and Dentistry, along with the Center for Design and Manufacturing Excellence, uh, Infectious Disease Institute, and the Institute for Materials Research, all collaborated with the national consortium that rapidly deployed a design and testing program for 3D printed testing swabs. Ohio State then started working with 3D manufacturing company Formlabs in Toledo 
and academic uh, institutions across the state of Ohio to manufacture these swabs and swab kits uh, in significant quantities. Very soon, the first order of 15,000 3D printed swabs for COVID-19 test kits will be delivered to Ohio State with a target of 200,000 swabs and swab kits to be shared in partnership with our Department of Health and hospital systems across Ohio, allowing more people to be tested, uh, and this all by the end of April. So again, Ohio ingenu ingenuity, Ohioans coming together to solve a problem. Today was supposed to be tax day. Um, as everyone knows, uh, that has been delayed, both at the federal level and then uh, at the state level. Uh, I appreciate the General Assembly formally, formally extending Ohio's tax deadline. Uh, while Ohioans have more time to complete the tax form, uh, it is time to complete the 2020 census form. So we would encourage everyone to do that. The Constitution mandates a census be held every 10 years. And one of the things that this determines, of course, is federal dollars that, that come back to Ohio. Uh, our congressional delegation, the number of members of the House of Representatives, that is determined by this census and many, many other things. Um, our response rate is, is pretty good. Uh, but I want to do a little challenge here. It's always good to uh, challenge our, our friends up north in Michigan. Uh, we, are, we are lagging a little bit. Ohio's response rate, I am told, is now 52.2%. Michigan is at 55%. So I'll challenge my fellow Buckeyes, uh, myself included, uh, to get this done and get this in, and let's see if we can uh, overcome the lead that Michigan has. Uh, you can, for information on this visit, uh, 2020census.gov. That's 2020census.gov, or you can call 844-330-2020. That's 844-330-2020. I want to talk for a moment uh, about our prison situation. Uh, and as we've indicated uh, at this stage uh, of this virus, uh, we continue to worry about a lot of things, but we certainly worry about any place where there's congregate living. Uh, we worry about our nursing homes, uh, and we worry about our, our, our prisons. I want to give you a little update in regard to our, our prisons. Um, I told you on Monday that one inmate with COVID-19 died at the Pickaway Correctional Institution. Uh, Sadly, uh, we now have two more inmates who have died at that facility. They're listed as probable caused by COVID-19. Uh, we'll, we're waiting on confirmation tests in regard to that. Uh, our team has been working on different strategies to create more room for social distancing within our state prison. Uh, the director and I had a call about this this morning. Uh, we involved uh, Ohio State University, who are, who are giving us uh, very significant help, and I want to publicly thank them uh, for the help that they're supplying. Uh, last week, under an overcrowding statute uh, that has been on the books for some time in Ohio, uh, we alerted the Correctional Institution Inspection Committee about the overcrowding and advised them of our intent to release certain inmates who are ready for release in the next 90 days. Uh, we set forth criteria that, that I determined uh, for those who we would consider for early release. So we started with everyone uh, who is going to be released anyway in the next 90 days. Then we eliminated sex offense, offenders, homicide-related offenses, kidnapping, abduction, ethnic intimidation, uh, terrorist threats, and domestic violence. Uh, we also screened out those who had been denied judicial release in the past, any who have prior incarcerations in Ohio, uh, anyone who has an interstate, who is an interstate offender or who have warrants or detainers on them, and those who have serious prison rule violations in the last five years. Yesterday, the Correction Inspection uh, Committee agreed with our limited overcrowding determination and recommended uh, the early release of the inmates who fit uh, that specific criteria. Earlier today, uh, I approved uh, the early release of 105 inmates under that section of the Ohio Revised Code. Again, they are people who qualified 
for early release because they had only 90 days or less until they were released anyway, and they were individuals who did not fall within the list of criteria I just listed where we did not feel comfortable in releasing them uh, early. Uh, the director has advised me that each of the inmates being released will, will in fact be tested uh, to determine uh, whether or not uh, they have COVID-19 and appropriate action will be taken um, in regard to those, those results. Um, let me add uh, one other thing. Um, we are, I've authorized uh, our prison system to, and the director, to continue to use this criteria. Uh, every day, of course, more people enter the list of people who are within 90 days of being released. Uh, and I've instructed the director to screen out those who do not qualify um, because of the severity of their charge, conviction, uh, and so this process will continue. So we would expect to continue to release uh, prisoners, this specific group of prisoners, those who have 90 days or less. When someone enters that 90-day period of time, we will look at that individual to see whether they qualify, uh, and then we will move, we intend to move forward uh, with those releases. Let me also add uh, some additional news. Uh, <clears throat> the prison system population fluctuates every day. Uh, people are released every day, people come in. Uh, the prison uh, sets the, the Tuesday just as a date to report. So every Tuesday they report the number of prison inmates uh, because the day-to-day -day average just fluctuates all, all over the place. But uh, they report one day and that day is Tuesday. Uh, we have seen uh, three, the, our population in prison drop uh, by 311 inmates. Uh, we want to thank the local judges uh, for the actions that, that they are taking. Um, this has resulted in a drastic reduction in the number of inmates being sent to our state prisons uh, and does allow us more room for the social distancing. Uh, we would expect those numbers to continue. Uh, within the last three weeks, I think the director has told me uh, that that total number of our population has gone down uh, by about 500. Uh, and that is uh, independent of the individuals that I just uh, announced uh, were, being, were being released. Uh, let me talk about one uh, final thing. Um, uh, early this morning, I had a, a lengthy conference call uh, with a number of uh, CEOs, representatives of major hospitals around the state. Um, and I want to go back for a moment. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that Dr. Acton ordered uh, some time ago was that no elective surgery sh should take place. Um, the reason that was ordered uh, was twofold. One, a concern about our hospitals themselves being crowded and not being ready uh, for the COVID-19 patients. Uh, but Probably the more important reason uh, was because of our lack of personal protection equipment. Uh, and let me just state what our concern was then and what, what our challenge remains today. Uh, and that is that we have enough personal protection equipment for the hospitals, uh, for people working in the hospitals. But we also want to make sure that our first responders have that. Uh, we also want to make sure uh, that those uh, individuals who are working in nursing homes have that one, certainly when that's appropriate. Uh, so that's our, our, our big goal. Uh, we are running into the same challenges uh, that every other state is running into. Uh, we put together a very aggressive team uh, that is doing a good job, uh, but it, that, is, that is not easy. Uh, so no elective surgeries because of the fact that we wanted to be able to conserve the personal protection equipment, which gets consumed, basically, as you do these operations. Um, we have seen in the last uh, week, we have flattened the curve. We've got to see where it goes in the next week. Uh, but we have, we have done that, and so we feel much better about the capacity in 
the, in, in the hospitals themselves. Uh, but again, um, the problem still remains and still a challenge in regard to personal protection equipment and having enough of that. Uh, so again, I want to make it very, very clear that the hospital procedures were not limited because the hospitals are not safe. Uh, they're limited because of the personal protection uh, equipment problem. Uh, on the call this morning, um, we were on the phone, I think, about two hours, uh, and I asked the hospitals of the state of Ohio, uh, the hospital association, uh, to come up and, with, and get back with me with a plan, uh, a plan that would allow them to start moving forward and getting, getting back into dealing with what uh, one of the doctors on the phone referred to today as a de deferred health care. Uh, another way to describe it is delayed health care. And there is a concern, and I have a concern, uh, that let's say someone uh, who has had some, some uh, reason to have a colonoscopy every year, uh, and that's now being postponed for a few months. Uh, there's many other examples that I'm sure Dr. Acton will share with you of concerns uh, that well, wouldn't necessarily always be an operation itself, but might be some simply people who are deferring their connection with the healthcare system. Uh, and so that is a concern as we move forward. So I have asked them to get, come up and give us a plan. Uh, I gave them until a week from today. Uh, to come forward with that plan. Uh, I will look at that plan, and then as soon as uh, we, we've had a chance to look at the plan, approve the plan, uh, we will certainly share that with, with you. We'll share that with, with the public. Um, and so this is a step, uh, beginning of uh, the first, really the first step back as we, as we move forward. Um, I've asked them, uh, though, as they put the plan together, <clears throat> to still be mindful of the PPE challenge, because that's not something that we can just blow off. We've got to continue to be uh, concerned uh, with that. <clears throat> I've also asked uh, uh, each industry in the state uh, to start putting their best protocol together, uh, their plans uh, in regard to how they would protect their employees, how would they protect their customers if they were, when they're allowed to come back into business, when they're allowed to open up again? Uh, I've asked the <coughs> Lieutenant Governor uh, to, to lead that, uh, and he is going to be doing that. In fact, he has already been doing this for, for, for some time. Uh, those businesses that were deemed essential, uh, we want to learn from them. Uh, what they have learned in operating uh, during this period of time with COVID-19, because we know as we go into the future, it is still going to be with us. And when the businesses reopen, they're going to have to deal with COVID-19. They're going to have to deal with how you, they keep their employees protected, um, how they keep their customers protected. And so I've asked them to start down the pathway to, to look at that. Um, again, there's things to learn from them. Uh, we've asked them to come up with the best practices and to work with our health department um, in regard to uh, how they would proceed to open uh, when is the appropriate time to do that. Uh, let me now turn to uh, Lieutenant Governor Houston, John. Thank you, Governor DeWine. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, as the governor mentioned, uh, we, we all try to do our parts here as part of the team, and one of the things that I have tried to do at these 2 p.m. Uh, news conferences is to talk about the economic aspect of the pandemic, both in terms of how it affects business, how it affects the workforce, and no doubt one of the more popular questions we have received has been about unemployment compensation uh, over the past few weeks, not just getting questions at the personal level and the macro level, but also uh, really acknowledging the fears and frustrations that people have had. Uh, and one of the things I have felt that we need to do a better job of is getting more answers out there. So I spent the last um, week 
really trying to dig down and, and ask the right questions, make sure that we were on track to determine uh, you know, where things are. And what I want to do right now is to share with you what I found from, from that inquiry. Uh, I believe that the, all the folks working at ODJFS, they understand this, that they understand that there, there are fears and frustrations and that they know that the level of customer service that they have been pro providing needs to get better. To put some perspective on this, the system was built in 2004. That's the computer system. It's a mainframe COBOL uh, system, very outdated in terms of technology. It's not a cloud-based system. It, it was, uh, they have a plan to create a cloud-based system which will create more efficiencies and enable you to do uh, um, things much more quickly, but that system doesn't exist right now. So we're, we're in this battle w with the uh, system that we have. And it worked well. Uh, when the unemployment rate was 4%, it, it worked fine, both in terms of technology and staff, staffing. It was adequate for the task that it was being called to do. But, uh, and to put this in perspective, pre-pandemic, pre-pandemic, there were 42 people working in the call center. Uh, and that was sufficient to do the work that it was being asked to do. Now there are 1,194 people working in the call center and that still is not enough. Uh, there are many other agencies who've loaned employees to ODJFS to do this. Uh, they are scaling up new people as fast as they can, but they have a limited number of trainers and a limited number of, of people uh, that they can take through that training at a time. And so they're staffing that up, as they've told me, as fast as they can. I want to put this in perspective because I talk about pre-pandemic versus now. More claims were filed in the last month than in the last two years. And, and that puts in perspective, you know, what, what their, uh, uh, what the challenge is that they're facing. Um, I asked the question, you know, phones and processing claims, why not add more? And, and they are, they assured me that they are and uh, that, that one of the things that I think many people, um, including myself, didn't have a full appreciation for is that, you know, during the pandemic, we talk about a call center. Well, it's not a call center. It's not like there are physically people there because of the pandemic. We can't have fi people physically there in, in that close proximity with one another. Uh, but they're doing this from a distance. The tech, they have the technology that allow people to do this from their homes, and upgrading that and upskilling that technology and upskilling the people to do that was part of this process. Uh, that is, and that has been done and is underway uh, as they continue to try to improve upon the system, uh, the unemployment comp system. This is what I was promised will happen over the course of, um, will happen over the course of this week, uh, that they will add text to speech capabilities. Those have already added, those should create some efficiencies. They will onboard an additional 337 staff once this training that I talked about is complete. Before the end of the week, they will introduce an interactive voice recognition system and bot technology that will help, that will provide two ways to answer those frequently asked questions so you don't have to wait online and, and, and talk to an actual person. We can get that move through the process more efficiently. By the end of next week, the Ohio Department of Jan Job and Family Services has promised the following. They will launch a virtual call center to speed up wait times for people who need to call to talk to someone at the office. So they're going to add that. They will add a uh, they will begin the process, they will begin processing the additional $600 a week payments authorized under the Federal CARES Act. They will launch an online tool uh, that is being developed for self-employed 1099 workers to get in line early. And this is important, so if you fall into that category, by the end of next week they will have the application process available, although they will not be able to process those plans claims for payment until May the 15th. But by the end of next week, they have promised that they will have the online early application process 
um, available. They also uh, promised that they will launch uh, e-application improvements by next week uh, to improve the individual services for customers. I will also add something that is very important that may save individual customers some time. Remember to, when you're implying to enter a mass layoff number of 2000180, this eliminates the need to verify your employer if you enter this number, 2000, so 2180. Uh, and that will speed up the process of verifying who your employer is and, and should help get that claim processed faster. On May the 1st, ODJFS expects to be able to process applications for people who are entitled to an additional 13 weeks of unemployment under the CARES Act. So those who are added that 13 weeks, that, that is coming on May the 1st. So these are the things that they have promised are on the way to continue to, to continue to improve the service. I guess the message is, is that they are, that we and they hear you, that they have added capacity, they will continue to add capacity and tech tools that will help improve this. But the bottom line is that this process will not stop improving until everybody is served uh, and that reassurance that everything that you're eligible for will be backdated to that time. And uh, we spent a lot of time going through this with the folks at ODJFS. Uh, they have committed to those timetables for those improvements. And um, I just want to reassure you that uh, until it's, until it's, it's uh, delivering the level of customer service that people deserve, uh, they will continue to make those improvements. Uh, additionally, um, uh, we got a question yesterday. Uh, from Jim Adi, uh, and at, he asked a question about unemployment, about a business in Dayton where there were 40 people who worked there and they had received the information that only four of them have been ser had been served. And I know when I heard that, my heart dropped. I was like, I can't believe that that really happened. Uh, I was very frustrated by it. And I, I did some digging to find out if this was true. And I want to use this as a case study because this really kind of represents what the experience might be of a typical employer of 40 people. And I want to report back. First of all, six claims uh, existed before the pandemic and all of them have, uh, are approved and being paid presently. 22 claims have been approved since March and are being paid. So of, of the 40 people that were discussed, 28 of them uh, are already being paid. Three of the pandemic claims were denied because the individuals did not meet the threshold to qualify for unemployment. However, they may be able to qualify once the 1099 uh, system is stood up. And then there were eight claims that were pending uh, that needed more verification on a number of things, everything from social security number uh, to a variety of things that were inconsistent. Uh, the reason I share that with you is because when you ask questions, we take the questions seriously. We take what people are, are concerned about seriously, and we track them down, and we, and we try to get you answers. And I think that this really demonstrates, you know, the, the, what, what exists out there from a typical employer, maybe what you're hearing and what is actually happening. And, and in conclusion, while we talk about the people who have lost jobs, uh, there are also a number of employers out there, as I say every day, who are hiring to, be, to, to fill those essential business roles, those essential services roles. And at coronavirus.ohio.gov slash job search, uh, we, they continue to add jobs. 669 employers on there today with 41,433 jobs available. So if you're able to help with that, we really, you know, it, they would really appreciate it. We would all really, really appreciate it. We're all in this together. We're helping people in need. We're trying to get people employed uh, when employers need them. And we're trying to bring all this together as efficiently as possible to better serve you. So, Governor, thank you. Dr. Acton. Thank you, Governor. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm busy taking notes over here as Don's speaking. So uh, to begin with, we're gonna start out today once again, um, giving you some of the data we have. 
and also answering, just as the Lieutenant Governor was saying, some of the questions that were raised yesterday. So we'll go ahead and start. Um, today we do have um, confirmed cases total, 7,791. Um, we have cases in 87 of our 88 counties now. We, we've documented cases and community spread. And deaths um, in Ohio have now totaled, um, as of reporting today, 361 deaths. Um, again, it's really important to say that we still know that these numbers are the tip of the iceberg um, for very many reasons, mostly because of our lack of testing and some issues with reporting, which we'll be digging into deeper in the days to come. Um, but I'd like to then go, what do we have next here? Um, here is our usual, we have now 71,000 uh, tests having been run in Ohio, and everything else is pretty much sticking the same. We're still seeing hospitalizations because we're targeting our testing to highest risk groups um, at 29% of cases. ICU missions being 9%, um, healthcare workers making up 21% of our cases. Um, and so of that, long-term care residents um, at this point totaling 700 of our cases. So let me go back to some basics about our data. And do we have any other? Let me just make sure I haven't missed something. Oh, very important, and maybe I'll leave it at this slide. Very important for us is following trends, and I'll tell you why here. First of all, we made a commitment a long time ago, especially in an area of just great disruption and unprecedented change, to share with you what we know when we know it. And I think that's really important for so many reasons, but most importantly, it is about trust. And it is about a time where it's really hard to understand all of what is happening to us. But these are complicated things we're sharing. So let me start first with data. So we're sharing with you a lot, and on our website, there's much, much more than I'm sharing here, epidemiologic data. Now this is data we collect with every infectious disease. It's a routine part of trying to really understand the, the spread of disease. Um, but um, we are in something that has numbers and changes that are larger than anything we've experienced before. So some numbers that we give you are what we know now, and some of them are more helpful to look at in more nuanced ways. So for instance, um, we give you symptom onset data. That's epidemiologic data. We hear about a case on a given day, but our epidemiologists go back and they look at when did symptoms actually start because that's much more important to us clinically in detecting this. So symptom onset data is different than some of the other data we report, which is the day we get those cases defined or test results. Another thing that is different is the day a person died versus the day we learn about it. Death data, and we'll go into this in much more detail, this is something that's being discussed, um, has always been a difficult thing. By the time someone dies and they actually get diagnosed versus the time it takes to get to vital statistics and then is reported in mass, unaggregated, those are, those are always complicated issues and I'd really love to delve into that at some point. But one thing about the data we're showing you in some of our graphs is that yesterday, for instance, we had been reported that we learned that there were 50 Ohioans who died yesterday. Some of those Ohioans who died, died the day before. Some of them died possibly a couple weeks ago. There are people that died today. We learned today of 37 deaths in Ohio. There are actually people who died today that we will not learn about for days to come. So that data is coming in for various reasons. Sometimes someone dies and their actual test result has not yet returned. That has diagnosed them as being a COVID death. So that data is different um, than saying how many people we learned about today. 
And you'll see that, and when you go back, and when enough time has passed, that's how we do our sort of annual reports of death and things. But those, that data is constantly moving as we're learning. And very difficult in this pandemic is the fact that it is a long incubation period in this disease. So we have people who are asymptomatic who have the disease. By the time their symptom onset occurs, which we actually learn about once we know about them as a case, and we don't know about most of our cases that are at home recovering, but of those we know, their day of onset of symptoms is usually about five days, but could be as late as two weeks. And then it is days and days and days before someone who has this disease might get sick enough to be hospitalized. And then we get hospitalization data. And someone is in the hospital, but they might not yet be in the ICU. And we get those ICU numbers. And then people dying is lagging far behind that. So it goes back to that starlight example I gave you back in the beginning. Some of the data we get is real time, it exactly happened today, and some of it is telling us about things that might have happened weeks ago. But the important thing for all of us is that we compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges and be consistent in that and look at all of that data in the context of trends. And that's so important too. Another thing that can complicate data is reporting, and sometimes, while we would like everything to be like the lieutenant governor said, in a cloud-based system in real time, a lot of our systems are older um, that exist uh, that we use. We're all fighting to modernize them, but that, that's, again, a story for another day. But, but, but that this data is um, important to know that we're capturing it and comparing it over time. And that really gives you what is useful information. So on a weekend, on one given small hospital perhaps, maybe the person who reports that was out sick that day and there wasn't a refill. So oftentimes we even find that weekends can be tricky and that on Mondays we might get a clump of data that was over the weekend. And that's why, again, data is useful, but we always have to look deeper and understand the data, understand what's good and bad about the way it's reported, and look at it over time to give us informed decision making. Um, our decisions are made on so many things. They're made on data, they're made on better and better data all the time on this disease, but they're based on a lot of other factors as well. But we promise you to give you everything we have as we know it, and, and that'll be an ongoing dialogue we have. A um, Couple other things I wanna talk about from yesterday. First of all, um, someone asked a question about talking to young people at home. And I want you to know that I've become increasingly aware once we started doing these briefings that um, there are young people watching at home. It's something I think about, Governor, when I say some of the things I say because I think it's so important that we are responsible in how we share our information. So we have had all along on our website a bunch of tips, and even since yesterday, more and more came in from the Academy of Pediatrics, from clinical psychologists, and we are collecting all that for you at home. So don't forget, I haven't said it in a long time, coronavirus.ohio.gov, a great place to go to learn more tips. Um, a little teaser, a little spoiler alert, um, we have been working in the background on doing one of these just for kids. That's coming in our near future, but we thought it could be useful um, to kind of give information in a way that young people could hear it. So that's a little teaser of something yet to come. Um, I want you at home as a parent to remember a book that oldie but goodie, Winnicott, um, The Good Enough Parent. And this is something I started out in peds before I went into preventive medicine and public health. And there's a lot of finger wagging out there in the world, but as a parent, you just gotta get it good enough, and you're gonna have good and bad days. But do, kids do pick up on things we say and how we say it. Taking time to be as calm and reassuring as you can. Taking time to just talk, because as you know, they'll say the things you just never thought they were picking up on. It's really important for us to be careful about the amount of media our kids are seeing. Um, and, and again, you'll have days when you're anxious, but don't, don't kill yourself over that. Please know and forgive yourself and try again, as we all do, <laughs> the very next day. Um, lots of tips out there. 
Um, in the days to come, I'd also like to talk to you more about how you're feeling. And, and, and we have some guests that we'll be bringing on to help you just as a parent as you're navigating this. Um, I have to say we had a fabulous conversation again with our hospitals. And um, I want people to know, I just want to reiterate what the governor was saying, that um, for those of you out there, if something has changed in your symptoms, reach out to your doctor, reach out to your primary care person. If you don't have that, it's okay to reach out to emergency rooms. Our hospitals are very, very safe places. Our hospitals are becoming hospitals without walls. They are working closely with our nursing homes, with our prisons, with our community, with our federally qualified health centers. We are all in this together, and I, I can't say enough about how outstanding they're doing. The video that you saw, um, I was greatly impacted by that Patel video you just showed and the couple. Remember that we're all learning and all going through this together, and it is a time that is very troubling because there's a lot of uncertainty. We're having to tolerate a new world, not unlike post 9-11, where the rules have changed and they're not gonna be quite the same. But they're also the things that open us up to great wonders and that kind of innovation. And we're seeing that as well. So while they, these are troubling times for us where we don't always know all the answers right away, and we have to tell you honestly, we don't know. These are also times that we will learn tremendous things together, and we will always tell you what we know as we know it. Thank you. Dr. Acton, thank you very much. Have questions? Hi, this is Molly Martinez with Spectrum News. Dr. Acton, thank you very much for expounding on my question yesterday about how to talk to kids. I appreciate that. My question today is for the Lieutenant Governor, um, and it deals with um, liquor. Have, <laughs> uh, what's your favorite? No, I'm kidding. Um, have you thought at all about waiving liquor renewal fees that are due in May since restaurants and liquor establishments are largely closed right now? And um, also a viewer question, has child support been affected at all by sort of this time of duress? I'll take the liquor one. Um, we have and we're working on it. Um, again, it's back to kind of basic justice uh, that if you have the uh, a permit and you're paying for a permit and you can't use it, um, there should be something you get back. And the idea would you get it would be prorated. Uh, so we're figuring out how to do that mechanically, uh, and we'll have an announcement in in the future. Yeah, I. Right on, we're, we're working through those things, as the governor said. I believe we have uh, ODJFS Director Kim Hall available on the line who pr can provide some more insight into the child support component. Kim? You on there, Kim? Good afternoon. Yes. Good afternoon, Governor, Lieutenant Governor. So uh, our child support office uh, is very engaged right now with our county agencies. We know that uh, our uh, collections are still occurring. In addition, the unemployment benefits are offset by child support. So those are continuing to flow in as well. So children that are beneficiaries of those uh, child support payments can still continue to receive those. Thank you. This question is for the Lieutenant Governor. I'm Jim Province with the Blade. Um, you. As you know, the Ohio's unemployment compensation system has been underfunded for years, um, and it's likely going to have to borrow from the federal government again this time to get through with these obligations. Um, usually, those funds are repaid through surcharges, a tax on employers. Could you talk about um, the impact of having an additional tax like that as businesses come back on board and try to recover from this? Well, I can tell you that the governor and I just had a conversation about this a, a little while ago. Uh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you kind of where I see things as it stands. Uh, without federal assistance, the uh, 
unemployment compensation system will be insolvent somewhere in June, sometime in June. That's what the expectation is. Uh, in answering the question, the one thing that I want to reassure folks on is that does not mean you're going to lose your benefits, okay? That's an important piece, I think, that we need to do. To do. So what the solution will be uh, will be in large part up to the General Assembly. We will need to work with them on this uh, as to the prescription for how we're going to do this, whether we're going to uh, ask for a larger employer contribution, whether or not uh, long-term benefits would be reduced, uh, whether or not uh, the state would borrow money to do this. So there are a variety of, of ways that you can go about addressing it. No decision has been made on those because it's clearly something that we would have to do in consultation uh, and with the support of the General Assembly. Would you prefer that there be no surcharges on employers given the circumstances? You know, I'll look at the whole thing. I don't think we want to, I mean, it would be great if we could do this. <laughs> If, if, if we had a, a source of money, maybe through the federal government, that they're, that they're talking about doing to supply some of the states with these funds. But look, this is a responsibility we'll all have to, we'll all have to address. Uh, it's not, you know, it, it, this is a zero-sum question. It's, it's either going to come from the employers or, or from the people who are unemployed, and you just have to strike the right balance. Thank you. A question for Governor DeWine. John Kosick from News 5 in Cleveland. Uh, listening to Dr. Acton talk about the facts and data, I, I was reminded of something that I had heard that this has been called a partisan pandemic where the facts and data that you believe depends upon where you live and what channels you watch. Speak to the difficulty you, you may be facing as you hear these calls to reopen and the political pressure while you try to focus attention back on those medical facts and data. Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, I felt all along that the most important thing that I could do as governor is to level with the people of the state of Ohio and tell them what we knew and when we knew it. Um, and that's what we're going to continue to do. Um, I think there is a natural inclination, my inclination, I know that, uh, and I'm among Ohioans. Uh, to say, okay, let's go do it. Let's go win. Let's go do what we have to do. And then we win. Uh, the sad truth is, uh, you know, that we've won the battle. Uh, we've, we have, it appears, we've flattened this curve. But the, uh, <clears throat> the monster is still out there, loose, and uh, is going to be out there probably uh, until we get it until we get a vaccine. And what that means is we're going to have to live with this. And explaining to people of Ohio that when we open back up, it's not going to look like it looked before. And everyone will have to weigh their own, make their own choices, as they always do. But now they're going to have to weigh in, what are my chances if I do this? that I'm going to get COVID-19 uh, because it's still, going to, it's still going to be out there. Now, our job uh, is to do everything we can to make it better for individuals, uh, inform individuals of what their personal situation is, uh, and make sure that employees, when they go to work, have as safe a place as we can make it and the employer can make it. Uh, when people uh, do anything else, uh, everything that we can to make that as, as safe as we can. Um, so that's, I, I think, the challenge. It's our natural inclination as Ohioans to go fight and win. And we've done very well, but this thing is not going to end, and, and it's going to continue. And so, you know, the challenge that uh, I've laid out to our business community is, I know you want to open. Um, and to the business community that's already open, I know you want to stay open, but we got to figure out how we make it as safe as, as possible for your employees. And, and I know that you're concerned about that as well, I say to the businesses. So, so we've got to do that. When we get to schools, uh, to open back schools, we're going to have to figure that out. How are we going to do this in a safest way as, as possible? 
Uh, this is something I'm going to be talking with superintendents about, and John, John's been talking to superintendents. We've got a call we're setting up uh, for additional conversation with me and superintendents. So these are the different, you look at the different segments of, of, of the community as we move forward on these, we have to figure out how to do this as, as safely as we can. Thank you. Hi, this is Laura Hancock from cleveland.com. I have a question for Dr. Acton. Um, you had talked yesterday about how we um, have kind of flattened it, and so when we get to the peak, it'll be almost, I think you called it like, you know, imperceptible. And so I'm just wondering, the forecast model is still stay, saying today 1607 um, new cases for Sunday. Are you thinking that's not gonna happen now, or what, what's your um, thoughts? Remember that that is forecasting how many are out there in total. We know that we are only testing a small percentage of the cases. Remember, we prioritize our testing that we have on three tiers and that most of the cases, no matter what number that number was, was going to be a best guess and a, a fraction of them because about 80% of people right now are being diagnosed with COVID um, by their doctor based on clinical signs and potentially their contact with someone else known with it. But they're staying at home. There's no test to give them. So we really, this is an estimate how, of how many cases could be out there right now. Now, what, what we all wish for is to know the real, actual prevalence in Ohio. And you've heard us talk about doing a small study the governor's been talking about lately. We're going to start with a sample size of 1,200 um, and eventually spread that out. But what we're trying to do is get a better sense of how many are out there. We know that people are out there who are asymptomatic, up to a quarter, that are spreading the disease but don't know they have it yet. But we also don't know the numbers of all those people who have had it. There's no way to them to report. So remember, it's, that's what's so confusing, I know, for everyone with the modeling, is it's saying it, that number was used to help hospitals better understand how much equipment they might need. And of course, that number went down with the extreme social distancing we did. And of course, that number could go up if we weren't being protected. I do want to take one moment and every day I'm going to be really annoying now, and talk about what you're wearing right now, Laura. Um, you know, I, that all of us are um, talking about this mask. Um, it was just, I, I do have my phone today, and someone just texted that um, the governor of Maryland and the governor of New York have both issued orders on universal mask usage. So that is something um, that we're trying to do here. We haven't ordered anything. But I think, you know, there's so many things that are changing in our world. And we have now learned that these masks, not the N95s that we're saving for our healthcare professionals, but the ones we're, we're using, can really be another layer of protection. They're sort of functional social distancing. And it's really, really important. So for the rest of us, if we want to feel extra safe and protected, and also for employers as they're making safe workplaces, these masks are part of the future. And I think that's exciting because at a time when sometimes we feel like it's so frustrating that we don't have the weapons that we wish we had, more PPE, more testing, um, even the things that you're doing, and I'm seeing it everywhere, everywhere I go around town, what you're doing is making a difference. Don't stop fighting this war, Ohioans. You cannot stop. You have to keep even as we go about, and we can move about, we can go for a walk, we can make that trip to the grocery store when we need to. Use this, it will protect you. And remember, it's not just you you're protecting. We are worried about the people who work in nursing homes, the people who work in hospitals, the people who work in prisons. It's not the prisoners who are going out and catching this. Unfortunately, it's all of us who can go about that are catching it and spreading it. So we all have to be diligent, not just when we're on the job, but as we go about our lives, because it is those degrees of Kevin Bacon of spreading it. And every time one of us doesn't spread it, we greatly decrease its impact, as we saw we did in Ohio. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ben Schwartz with WCPO in Cincinnati. I would like to address 
the uh, Lieutenant Governor with this question. Um, Lieutenant Governor Husted, we've been getting a lot of questions sent in from Ohio's essential workers, and a lot of them are worried about being put in a tough decision about whether to work and potentially infect themselves and thus their families and friends, or to not work and potentially lose their job. Um, this specific question we got today was asking if someone were to quit their job out of that fear, are they eligible for any type of help through unemployment um, or anything along those lines? Well, it, look, these are, this is why when we talk, when we talk about the economy, we always talk about wanting workers to feel safe and wanting customers ultimately to feel safe. That, that's, what, that's what we continue to try to, to create an environment where that can happen. In, in the stay-at-home order, under the provision for essential businesses, there is a list of protocols that businesses must take to make sure that their workplace is safe. Um, and everybody who's operating should be uh, operating under those circumstances. Uh, if, an, if an employer is not doing that, that employee should report them to the local health department and they should enforce it. Uh, you know, in terms of how safe they should feel, I, I, I guess I can defer ultimately some of that to Dr. Acton, but, but I, will, I will say that what we're trying to build is a worker fit environment, not just for those essential businesses that are there now, but as we go forward, because those list of protocols that we've been working with businesses on are, are keeping people safe. And with the businesses that we talk to who are doing this, it, both who have operated in China and Italy and other countries have successfully operated with these, with these um, protocols in place and, and not had a spread of the virus in the workplace. So I, I, would, I would just say to those folks that, the work, that your employer should be doing these things to make the workplace safe. Uh, that's what they're there for. Uh, if the employer is following them, in, they should, they should feel it is a safe place to work, although every one of us can take additional measures by personally staying six feet away, by wearing the masks, by washing our hands, by not touching our face, by you know, not touching things in common areas or congregating around other people. So those are the things that we can all do to uplift or, or great, give ourselves a higher level of safety. And uh, I don't know if the governor or the, the, uh, the, the director, Dr. Acton, has anything that they would like to add to that to maybe fold that out. You're good? I'm good. Okay. Thank you. No, good, good question. I, you know, it is, uh, I would reemphasize what John said. If someone does not feel safe in their workplace, they should report that. Uh, as we move forward and, and, and look towards uh, the non-essential businesses being able to open, you know, their ability to provide a safe working place uh, is not only something that they, they, they need to do because we're telling them to do it, but they need to do it for their employees. They need to be able to do it to make sure they can attract employees to work there. And, and look, the vast majority of the businesses I've talked to, they want to do everything that they can. Uh, and so, we're going to try to help them by getting kind of the best practices from whatever industry that is or particular business that is and, and really kind of pooling information uh, so that we can give them the best practices and give them the guidelines that they need. I think that's going to help them attract customers. It's going to depend on what kind of business it is, if it's retail, but also uh, you know manufacturing or whatever it is, it's going to help them make sure they can keep the employees there uh, keep them working uh, and provide them that that safe safe place. I believe I, I left one part of my answer short because you asked would they be eligible for unemployment if they just quit their job. I do not believe they will, but we have Director Hall on the line, and I will get that uh, confirmed uh, through Director Hall. Uh, yes, confirmed, Lieutenant right Governor. Oh. I'm sorry. Please go ahead. Yes, Lieutenant Governor, that is correct. We do have a provision that allows for good cause refusal 
and good cause circumstances, but when you have an offer of employment in most circumstances, you would be rendered ineligible if you refuse to return to work. Okay, thank you all very much. Again, it's like anything else, so it's fact, it's fact specific. You'd have to know all the facts of what the circumstance was. Thank you. Hello, Governor Ben Garbrick with ABC6 Good. and Fox 20 in Columbus. You mentioned earlier some more prisoners that you might be releasing early because of concerns about COVID-19, but you also mentioned that this is a, a work in progress. Considering we've only seen a couple dozen here, a hundred today, but there are thousands of prisoners in Ohio state prisons, how many more people do you think would need to be released and what circumstances would those people need to be in to be released, yeah. you think? in order to have some proper social distancing and other measures in place to prevent the spread or have any outbreaks at any prisons like we've seen at other jails and prisons across well, the country? We, we ask ourselves, I ask my team uh, virtually every day, are there other prisoners that we can release? Um, and when you, when you look at what they're in there for, what we know about them, I mean, for example, I ask a question today about uh, some of the ones who are in the worst health. Uh, and th they've been in there, most of them, for a long time. There's a reason they've been in there for a long time. So, it, you know, people can look at the numbers and say, gee, you could, you could release X number of people. But as governor, I have the responsibility that the person I'm releasing, uh, we have to weigh what the odds are that that person will recommit a crime uh, or, or um, you know, what that person is initially in there for. And, and so that's the challenge uh, that we, we face every single day. Um, you know, we're taking the people who are thin, uh, you know, they can see the finish line of their sentence. And as I said today, we're, that's going to be rolling. Every time one enters that period, every day, we're going to consider them eligible. And as long as they don't, they're not murderers and rapists and a few other things, uh, we're going to make them eligible to get out early. Now, you know, they're going to be under some supervision. Um, and when they complete their total sentence, depending on what they're in there for, uh, they may be under supervision or they may not be. But it's always a balancing question. Uh, you know, today, uh, with the help of Ohio State, uh, we're going to increase the testing. Uh, we're going to take that up to as high a level as we can do per day. As many tests as we can get. Why? Well, it enables the director and the prison officials to make better decisions, knowledgeable decisions about who has it and who does not have it, and how to segregate them and separate them, and how to manage that, that population. So it is a weighing every day. Uh, and I have a discussion, I can guarantee you, every single day with the director and our team. What else can we do to deal with the situation? But we have to balance the safety of the public along with what's going on in, inside that prison. We've dramatically increased personal protection. Uh, we have guaranteed, I, I guarantee the director this morning, uh, that there's going to be a flow of personal protection equipment going into that prison that, you know, if she's using it now, there's going to be some backup. But I gave her my word, we're going, to, we're going to do that. We also, as I said, had Ohio State on the phone today. Uh, and they have committed to do everything they can to dramatically increase the, the testing. So these are all things that uh, we, are, we are doing. Uh, the director is managing the population uh, the best that she can. And I thank the you know, all the people who work for DRC for, for what they're doing every day. Thank you. Kevin Landers, WBNS 10 TV. My question is for Lieutenant Governor. Hello. Hello. So if you're a 1099 employee, realistically, how long should you have to wait for your benefits and for the thousand uh, call takers that you have right now, do you believe that's sufficient to handle the amount of claims that will be going from now into the future? Or do you believe more will be needed? Okay, well, we, we are fortunate to have Director Hall on the line. I'll, I'll start off by saying that, that 
by the end of next week, they promised that people could apply, so that will help create some efficiency by at least getting the applications in, in, in place. And, and they have promised to have it up and running for processing by May the 15th. But I will let the director address the specifics about what, you know, what, what the mechanics are of that and, and what they plan to do on a staffing side. So, Director Hall. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. We know that the 1,100 or so that we have on the phones right now will not be sufficient, and that is why we have the call center effort that will be stood up next week to support both our current system, but then also support the new PUA system, Pandemic Unemployment Assistance System, through which 1099 filers and others who are right now not eligible for benefits could also apply. So we definitely know uh, and anticipate a significant amount of applicants and calls in that regard. And so with the benefit of a more freestanding virtual call center, we'll be able to utilize an outside vendor to help us with taking those calls to the new system. And in terms of filing a 1099, what's the realistic wait for someone to get their check? The goal with allowing individuals to begin getting their applications and as soon as the end of next week will be to have a process where we have that data kind of front loaded. So as the system is being built, it is essentially ready to go when when we go live in mid-May and, and payments can begin going out of the door. Even with our current system, once processing a claim is complete, we are caught up with paying that claim. So direct deposit is always the fastest way. There'll be some small number of paper checks always. We, we will have that dynamic certainly. But once we can move through processing the payment aspect of issuing the benefits will flow quickly. Governor uh, Noah Belindo with Hannah News Service. Uh, several days ago, you sent the National Guard to Elkton for a medical mission, saying it would be seven to 10 days or until federal assistance arrives. So have you heard of any level of federal assistance that would meet your uh, desires, or will you be extending that mission? I'm going to have to check on that. I'll get back to you on that. I'll, I'll talk to the general. We can get that to you today. Thank you. Adrian Robbins, NBC4. And my question's for the governor, and possibly Dr. Acton can weigh in on this as well. When it comes to random sampling that they're doing in some countries, when do you think that could be an option here in Ohio? And Ultimately, what do you want to accomplish with that data? Well, I'll start. Uh, we, we hope to do that, uh, you know, beginning in a couple of weeks. Um, the random sampling um, is going to, one thing it's going to tell us, uh, because it's random uh, and it will be a big enough sample uh, that statistically it'll be relevant, uh, is that's going to tell us how many, what percentage of the population roughly has had COVID-19. Uh, and that, that certainly is part of the information that we would like to get. Dr. Acton, you want to take the rest? Yeah. Good, a good afternoon. Um, so, so this is an attempt to get a sense of the prevalence of the disease in Ohio. This is a question everywhere, as you know, and with this new disease, novel disease, we're still learning a lot about it. And, and so, you know, it is a first attempt. It's designed by scientists um, all over the world. These sorts of studies are going on, and we're very blessed that we have great scientists, um, both at Ohio State, where some of the lead researchers are, but they're working in partnership with researchers all over the state. And it's a study design that is a long, kind of standing, good epidemiologic study. It's called a 30 by 30 model. But it's, it's sort of taking a representative sample and trying to get a sense, of the first sense. Now, we, we only, you know, it's hard to get any tests at all to look at blood serologic levels. So, and this will be of people who have evidence that they had the disease. Um, and, and so getting that kind of data will give us a first look 
and do. You know, we've known that up to 40 to 70% of folks can get this disease over the course of a year's time, but we really don't know yet what percentage of Ohioans have had it, already had it, many of whom have been asymptomatic. Um, many who have had it, but we just don't know about them. So, so this is good. This will help us start to design um, our interventions and make better decisions. The more sample, obviously, our dream would be that we could test everyone, but that's just not a reality. There's no one around this country who has enough tests to test everyone, and we know that that is a far off uh, reality for us to have that much test. So this gives us, you know, a good prediction of what that is and a good, a good, good estimate of that. So it's exciting. Um, I think it's very aggressive on Ohio's part. Um, we've been planning for this for a while. Um, but it is having some serologic testing and we're still waiting to get those tests. But once we have them, the researchers are ready to spread out across Ohio. It's only one thing we're doing of this nature. We're also looking at surveillance data, so federal database on influenza-like illnesses. We're looking at databases to see typical deaths and what's different about the deaths we're seeing now. We're also doing a big survey in Ohio um, to learn more about symptoms people have had. So we'll be sharing more and more about the kinds of studies that we're trying to get going uh, in the days to come. But it is um, everything we can do to learn more about this disease. You know, we're part of scientists all over the world and certainly all over the United States who are trying to learn as much as we can, as fast as we can, um, so that we can better deal with this, this enemy that we have in this virus. Thank you. And just to be clear, these are people who, who will be volunteering to be sampled? Um, I, I'll give you more details on that. It won't be, it's actually a sample that's done randomly. So, and, and I'm not the scientist on that, but I do think we'll have the scientists come talk to you about their study, so. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hi, uh, Lucia Lynchus for Ion Ohio. Um, I just have one quick question for Dr. Acton and one for uh, the Lieutenant Governor. Um, when you mentioned uh, you, you're looking for 1,200 people for your representative sample, and you also mentioned that you have um, obviously not enough tests uh, for all the places that you would like to test, um, do you have any guidelines on you know, how you uh, make sure to uh, you know, divide all the tests equally, both demographically and geographically, right. Right. Um, uh, throughout the state? So you know that's a very important question because it's important. We know that parts of our tests, our state are getting tested at higher levels than other parts, and we really want to make sure that we represent all groups. And so, in, baked into a lot of our testing is making sure we're not letting anyone fall between the cracks or people fall behind. So that's a very, very important distinction. Also, I need to tell folks out there: there, are, testing is the bane of every, I'm sure, governor, and I'm sure everyone, every health director around the states, we just wish we had more. And there are two basic types of tests. There are many, many brands and many trying to get FDA approval, but there are two types of tests. One that tell you you have it right now, and those are pretty good and accurate, but not perfect, because we know that sometimes early in the disease, people don't have enough of a viral load that you can even detect it. That's the PCR test you've been hearing about, the slow swab way that was really slow in the beginning, but now we have some rapid testing. But there's just not a lot of things that tell you you have it right now. The kind of test that, the other kind of test tells you that you've had it. This is gonna be a really big debate out there too. This is where your body develops antibodies, and it's these same antibodies that we're testing for to see if people can donate their plasma after having gone through this that could help people. And that amount, there are some different tests out there. There are some ELISAs that aren't going to tell you how immune you are, but they will definitely tell you that you have IgG or IgA in some cases, which are the antibodies that you have that show you had it and fought something. Now, everyone's dreaming that there will be an antibody test that could be this like thing, like you had it, you're immune, you're immune for X amount of time, and you can go back to work, right? That would be a dream also. We don't yet have the research that really is sound on that yet. Some of these antibody tests are, they don't tell you how much antibody or if you are effectively immune. So that's where you're hearing a complicated dialogue. But for our epidemiologic study, 
We don't need to know how immune you are. We just need to know you had it. And that actually isn't as complicated a blood test. And that's one that we're working on now to make sure we can start doing these studies. It'll just tell you you had it. Unfortunately, it won't tell you how effective your response was to keep you from getting it again. And that's, that's an, a subject for debate. But we are going to have blood tests. So there are tests that tell you you have it and tests that tell you you had it. And even of those tests, there are many, many brands and many kinds, shortages all over the place of things. But um, we're just trying to get enough. Our, if we could just get our hands on enough to start to look at prevalence, because we want that information. Thank well, you. Well, for, for example, if you had 100 tests, you know, do you divide them equally, uh, like, right. say, like geographically? Or like, how do you determine those 1,200 people? So there are sampling methods that are done. And they're done for all sorts of infectious diseases now. And some of these scientists do just these kinds of studies all the time out in the field. And basically, you know, it's the 30 by 30. And we're using the smallest group you can, because we're going to spare these tests, because there, there aren't a lot of them out there. But we are going to do the, the minimal statistical sampling method. And that method, um, we'll have a scientist who actually does this every day explain that in more depth. But it, it's fascinating. It's a very common research study, though, and it's one being used all over the world. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. D can my oh, do you have a Hi, Governor Andy Chow with Ohio Andy. Public Radio and Television State House News Bureau. As was mentioned earlier, Ohio's unemployment compensation system is antiquated. It's old. When you were in the process of deciding whether businesses should shut down or not, whether Ohio should go into a stay-at-home order, was the fact that Ohio's unemployment compensation system is antiquated, did that play a role in the conversations at all? Did you ever have to consider that before uh, shutting down businesses? Uh, we did not. Um, the only the other thing I would say, though, is you know, a lot of this, um, we are starting to see some businesses slowing down uh, before we issue the order. And it kind of goes back to what I've said, that as we move forward uh, and, and come out of this, uh, it's not going to be enough for us just to say open. The other thing that's going to have to happen is people are going to have to have confidence that they can go to this particular business or they can, you know, when you when we get to restaurants, that they can be comfortable going to a restaurant or comfortable going to a bar or something else. So, um, but the answer, the, the short answer is, uh, we, you know, we did not look at that. Um, we made the decision basically on, on health. Um, that's how we made the decision. Thank you. That was the last question. Well, we've asked a number of uh, talented Ohioans to uh, kind of share some thoughts with you, and uh, I think you'll recognize uh, some of the faces and voices. Hi, I'm James Buster Douglas. Hello, fellow Daytonians. My name is Allison Janney. It's IndyCar driver and fellow Buckeye Graham Rahal here. Hi, everybody. Jack Hanna here. Hey, everybody. It's Jerry from OAR. What's up, Ohio? This is Jay DeMarcus from Rascal Flats. And this is Katie Smith. Saludo, le habla Jose Ramirez. During this time, it's important to protect the ones we love and strangers. That's why it's crucial to practice social distancing. This is obviously a crazy time for, for everybody right now. If you must leave your home, make sure to stay at least six feet away from others. Do you know that's as long as a giraffe's neck? Cover your mouth when you cough and and wash your hands repeatedly throughout the day. And as Ohioans, we're coming together in ways we never thought possible to do what's best for our family and our communities. And now we have this opportunity to slow down um, and to really cherish these moments that we have with one another. Reach out to friends, make at least three or four phone calls a day. If you have elderly neighbors, reach out to them, see if you can help with groceries. I think something really important right now is a lot of kids in Ohio get, get their meals from school. So I, I think donations to the food bank if you're financially able. To all the health workers who and all the fields that are putting themselves out there to help um, our communities and Ohio, just thank you. Like, and I want you to know that we're all in this together. Even down here in Tennessee to up there in Ohio, 
we are all in this together. Not one state in this incredible union has been unaffected by COVID-19. Think of COVID-19 like it's the team up north. I'm a competitive guy as well, and we've got to take it down. We've one person does and can make a difference. In Ohio, we are in this together, Ohio. Y estando en casa es la mejor solución de estar tranquilo y de que todo pase. Eh, nos vemos pronto. Un abrazo a todos y estamos todos en esto. Remember, Ohio, we're all in this together, and I can't wait to see you guys soon. Well, we. Thank our fellow Buckeyes, and uh, we'll see you all tomorrow at 2 o'clock. Thank you.